Yeah, good morning and a warm welcome to all participants and thanks already for joining us today about our webinar together with the company Binder. My name is Frank Krebs. I'm responsible for the marketing for equipment instruments in Europe. Um, but before we start uh, with Lothar, our host today, just want to share a couple of housekeeping notes. First of all, you don't have to write anything down, make your notes or Sami. The full recordings will be shared right after the webinar together with a little survey. And all materials we show you in that webinar, they will be shared as well with you. So no, no need for you to write something down. Um, just listen, listen to Lothar, all materials we will share afterwards. If you have any questions, and we will appreciate every question you might have, please raise them and don't hesitate to raise them by using the question area. Um, so during the webinar and after the webinar, where we have a short uh, question and answer session, please um, raise your questions. We are happy to answer on them together with uh, Andreas Richter, the product manager from Binder, um, to make this uh, webinar for you as useful as possible. Um, and with having said that, I hand over to Lothar. And Lothar, already big thank you for joining for joining us today and to teach us about drying flammable and non-flammable solvents with vacuum ovens. Thank you very much. Frank for this wonderful introduction and greetings everybody from Tuttlingen in Germany. I can tell you it's cheering up right now. Sun is coming out. Um, I confess summer is over but um, autumn looks very nice right now after a couple of very cloudy and rainy days. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you and uh, we think this is something very special and an exciting session um, on drying flammable and non-flammable solvents with vacuum ovens. Something very very um, let's say out of the order if we're talking about drying because there are many many alternatives you have the choice between drying and heating ovens safety drying ovens vacuum drying ovens with and without ATEX certification and we'd like to guide you share you a couple of slides here with you the next 45 minutes or so um, and show you practical tips uh, following uh, solving day-to-day -day problems um, what can you expect? Well, actually, um, since these do play a major role, vacuum drying ovens in many branches, pharma, cosmetics, food and beverage, everywhere where you're using um, solvents of any type, um, or those being flammable, temperature sensitive, or oxygen sensitive, uh, vacuum drying ovens play a really important role. Um, you should consider a couple of things to ensure safe and reliable operation. We will be addressing that. And it will be, ladies and gentlemen, going far beyond any kind of technical product information. Um, we will be focusing on observing how to choose the right drying oven. Uh, from a huge portfolio, uh, depending upon um, applications, things that can influence uh, your decision um, will be addressed. Um, we'll be driving along, and this is one of um, um, one of um, Andreas's strengths: applicational knowledge. He's the guy who answers all those questions coming in from the field. Um, I have this specimen and this sample, and I'm working with this solvent. Help me, how long is the exposure time? What is the pressure? What is the temperature? So we got all together, I think, five very um, um, interesting applications for you. Um, something always being addressed, um, how to clean a vacuum oven, respectively, ladies and gentlemen, also the pumps. How to do that? You can do that without any maintenance service or um, servicing itself. And at the end, we'll be providing a small product selector with a couple of questions you can ask yourself and answer, and that will guide you to the right type of vacuum drying oven and pump. So the objective, what we're doing with this Learn Lab, this day-to-day um, um, -day problem solving um, session is to contribute to improve and maintain good practices when you are working with vacuum drying ovens. All right, one official um, um, chamber uh, uh, slides right here, right here before we dive into um, the nitty gritty of our topic. We were actually established 1983 by Mr. Binder right here. You see him on the left hand side standing in front of our R&D uh, building in Tuttlingen. That's somewhere between um, Black Forest and the Alps. 
Um, almost 500 employees worldwide last year, still growing very strong, manufacturing well over 22,000 units of all types. Please get that correctly, not only vacuum drying ovens. Where for the very first time in the history of the company, we jumped over the 100 million revenue mark last year. Very proud of that. And we do have a very, very high export share. Um, we just opened a couple of weeks ago an additional 2,500 square meters of production area, also a nice indication business is doing well these days, and we are in all major branches, simply due to the fact that these branches are driven by guidelines, standards, um, and norms. We have standard equipment, which means catalog product, article number, fixed price, such as the vacuum drying ovens, and we have customized solutions if an additional access ports or whatever are required, that's also possible. And as a highlight, we are actually the only manufacturer real worldwide who has a ATEX, who provides ATEX certified lab scale vacuum drying ovens. The largest volume we have is 115 liters, but we'll get to that further on the line. All right, here you go. The right choice for your application. Uh, we're taking a look at this, this cake diagram. In the upper left-hand corner, you see the explosion proof, the X, uh, the ATEX mark. And I'd like to share a couple of slides right here showing you the differences. Now we're talking about here on the um, upper right-hand side, drying and heating ovens. Very important and keep your, keep your eyes and attention focused on that convection-based heating, which means we have a fan that rotates inside and ensures a even airflow. We're working with normal pressure, the pressure you're sitting in right now, normal oxygen concentrations, the concentrations we're all breathing right now in our normal air, 20.9 volume percent of O2. We have non-flammable solvents typically water or acidic acid, for example. A maximum temperature, since non-flammable, goes up to 300 degrees C. That's quite usual, uh, quite normal, common um, on the market if you're uh, marketing for a, a drying and heating oven. Um, applications, typically anything around drying, curing, conditioning, uh, we call that um, tempering, for example or tension releases of metal alloys and things like that. And exact, uh, not so good for temperature sensitive and oxygen sensitive specimens. They really have to be able to resist higher temperatures and are um, not um, uh, at the risk of oxidations. And naturally, as you probably know, without any kind of pump, it's a normal drying and heating oven. Um, on the other hand side, lower, left-hand corner safety drying ovens. Now this is something very interesting because now we're working with inflammable solvents with concentrations below the lower explosion level, LEL. And that's very, very important. And a very a common question um, from customers is, when do I choose a safety drying oven and when do I go to a vacuum drying chamber ATEX certified? The safety drying oven, same as with the drying and heating ovens, fan design, normal pressure, not normal oxygen concentrations. Very typically, these safety drying ovens are designed to comply to the um, uh, Zenbean um, EN 1539 um, developed, I think, 20 years back or so. Um, talked to the head of the European working team who developed the norm back then. And he, by the way, is still using one of our chambers as a side note. Um, and that is typically for coatings, regardless if it's a polymeric material, plastic, um, um, metal alloy, any coating, but also potting components for, for um, um, to stabilize uh, PCB boards, for example, or um, adhesives with lower LEL concentrations. And once again, without a pump. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as you might have guessed, let's take a look at what we have with vacuum drying ovens. And we have two types. Let me start the lower right-hand corner. Vacuum drying ovens, we don't have a fan. The laws of physics um, does not make any sense to have a fan in there because there is no air inside. 
If we're down to 1.8 millibar, for example, using a vacuum pump, that's mandatory. Uh, you don't have any air there to transport the thermal energy coming from the heating system. We have negative pressures or under pressures. Um, normal sea level, as most of you probably know, 1,013 millibars. In Tutlingen, depending upon the weather situation and the elevation, we're around 700 meters above sea level. That would give us a 970 millibar normal pressure. And we're going below, as I already mentioned, 1.8 millibar. Lean oxygen concentrations in, in, in if you're using nitrogen or xenon or argon for flushing, um, at those lower pressures, you have lean oxygen concentration. I got a little um, fancy video there demonstrating how a, a candle goes out uh, with descending pressures. These are non flammable solvents. As I said, typically water used for rinsing. rinsing a maximum temperature 220 uh, because we're working with temperature and oxygen sensitive specimens just to give you a flavor of what we're talking about think of chocolate chocolate is rather temperature sensitive and if you want to dry anything which is sensitive to temperature or oxygen or, or oxidation sensitive vacuum drying oven is your choice on the other hand vacuum drying ovens with that atex certification to tell you, it costs a lot of money, time, and nerves to achieve that certification. It was pretty tough, the inspection by the, um, during the audit, but we achieved that. And as I said, we are the only company doing that. And once again, vacuum, no fan, negative pressure, lean oxygen concentration, which is a big benefit. That's a safety measure without any oxygen. Think of that triangle, you need oxygen, a combustion source, and a ignition source. If one of them is not uh, given, then you have no flame, then you have no explosion. And reducing that oxygen concentration very, very low, that is an additional, given by the laws of physics, um, safety measure. We are in um, well above the lower explosion level. That's the point of differentiation with the safety drying chambers we just addressed. Maximum temperature, 110. We conducted a survey. Uh, you might be asking yourself why we chose 110. We conducted a survey worldwide, and many, the majority of our users said, well, they actually never go above 100 degrees C due to safety issues, due to applicational issues. Um, so we added different 10 to really make sure we have full coverage of the most applications. And the second reason is the lower the temperature, the lower the risk of an incidence. It is APEX certified and very, very important. And we will be visiting the Guestis homepage to really show you um, where you can find information on your solvent um, uh, in that um, online uh, um, service. Uh, temperature classes one, two, and three. That's what normally is done. Four, five, and six are all together si uh, six different temperature classes. That is main. That is usually um, uh, too dangerous for a vacuum drying chamber. So that's why the majority of manufacturers stick to one, two, and three. And that naturally limits the uh, type of, of solvents you use. And very popular question, do I need an APEX certified pump for an APEX certified vacuum chamber? It is mandatory, ladies and gentlemen. Due to liability issues, occupational health issues, um, it's, it's better to have an APEX pump just in case uh, there's an accident. Then you're on the safe side. So this actually um, brings us to the pumps. And the pumps on the right-hand side, upper right-hand side, we have two types right here. Um, and naturally, we're using our pumps. You might want to excuse that. Um, but they differ in power, and we'll be going into that. And that has uh, something to do with application, with geometry, for example, for material, for the amount of solvent um, that has to be extracted, has to be dried out of the sample. Um, and naturally, as already mentioned, Atex chamber, needs a Atex pump. All right, so that's one of those key messages for you. Now let's return to that overview 
Um, and I'd like to dive into something very basic without getting too introductionary. I'd like to point out conduction-based heating for vacuum chambers um, because there's no air, no ventilator. We have to use the physics of conduction for thermal transportation while drying and heating ovens, safety drying ovens. Those are those, uh, you might know them with those fans inside. Now, what does that actually mean? And I got a little animation right here. On the left-hand side, what you see is a drying oven, very typical. You see the ventilator in the, in the middle, you see the, um, the circular heating rod, then you see a shelf crossing the interior lining. And what you then do, you place in your specimens two geometries, a block and a star formed one, then you turn on the heater, program it, let's stick to, to 70 degrees C, 50 degrees C as you wish. And then the thermal energy is transported via air into or onto the surfaces of the samples. Now that's normal. If you take a look at a vacuum drying chamber, the first thing you notice is we're missing any kind of heating rod inside and we're missing a ventilator because there is no air, no air movement. So we have to use another kind of physical method to get that heat energy, the thermal energy for the drying process into a vacuum chamber. So we're sticking to those two geometries right here and we're heating the walls. That's what we're doing outside of the chamber. It's very, very important, especially when you come around to ATEX compliance. So we're outside, we're heating the walls from the outside and the heat then creeps over large surface latches onto the shelf and from the shelf into the specimens without heating the vacuum, the under pressure. There is no air, don't forget that. And that's a big, big difference. Right? And it takes longer um, to do that due to safety reasons, especially if we're talking about APEX certified. Um, equipment, which is mandatory if you're above the lower explosion level. Now here you have also something very difficult, uh, different. We're going to go through three examples, basically showing the basic properties of vacuum using drying ovens as a comparison. Here, water boils at 100 degrees C at sea level. Everybody knows that. On the other hand, you can manipulate that um, boiling temperature in vacuum by decreasing the vacuum. Instead of uh, 1000 C level at 100, you can lower the, the uh, pressure down to 500 and you get a boil at 80 uh, degrees C. You can even go further. 60 degrees, the boiling point is somewhere around 200 millibars. And as you go down further, 40 degrees C, um, you can lower uh, the pressure all the way down to roughly about 100 millibar and then it boils at um, 40 degrees C. So those are the physics when it comes around to that. I think very nice example, many of us already know, uh, when it comes around to bringing water to a boil. How is that with conduction-based heating? Vacuum chambers, and this is that little video I'd like to show you. We're looking inside of a vacuum chamber, ladies and gentlemen. We have a candle on the left-hand side, a chocolate-covered a marshmallow if you want on the right hand side and both of them are standing on a red napkin. What happens during um, under pressure? Uh, once the door is closed, you'll see there are exciting things happening. All right, now what's taking place right now, that chocolate covering is bursting open because the vacuum is drying out those bubbles filled with air, the structural, uh, properties of the sweets of that candy, just drawing it out um, out of, of that foam. And once you return back to normal vac uh, to normal pressure, you see that uh, napkin flapping. So you're breaking the vacuum and you see how that chocolate covered marshmallow just collapses because there are all the bubbles have been removed. On the other hand, if, you, uh, if we take the time and take a look a second time, if you see that candle, we're lighting the candle before we close the door right here, ladies and gentlemen, then we decrease the pressure um, to about a tenth of sea level. So we're around about 110 millibars and you will see the, the, the flame extinguishes. And that is naturally a great 
physical um, feature if you're working with highly flammable substances because you need oxygen for an incident. Those are one of those three factors for a, a incident, all right? So that gives you a little bit an idea of what's happening in a vacuum drying chamber. And there are a couple of rules. The higher the temperature, the higher the boiling point in P pressure, and the shorter the drying time. It is essential depending upon what you're drying, what solvent you're drying, and how often you're drying that during a daily routine. The lower black dotted line, that is an empty device, just as a reference. Um, and the blue line, that is a 40 degree C temperature process. Below, you see the time frame, and on the left hand side, pressure in millibar. Please note, ladies and gentlemen, we are between zero and 100 millibar. We're not going up to 1000. So you get that scaled right. Um, and what you do see right here is that the drying process uh, takes around 105 minutes. If you increase that um, temperature to 60, that's the orange line right now. Um, and there you have a drying time of roughly, um, let's say 85 minutes. And if you increase that even further to 80 degrees C, uh, that is the quickest driest time, then you're around 50 minutes, not even an hour. And these are things you can adjust, you can manipulate according to your specific demands and application. Larger amounts, longer drying times. Makes a lot of sense. That was the first reaction of, of Andreas when I showed him this curve. And I said, hey, this is just to visualize that it is very, very comparable actually to drying and heating ovens. Um, the larger the, uh, the amounts, the longer the drying times. Here, once again, below the time axis, 360 minutes. On the left-hand side, the, millimeter, the milliliters of water dried. Um, so after 36, uh, minutes at 80 degrees C, you can drive 450 mil. Then at 60 degrees, with um, you have 230 mil in a vacuum drying chamber, and at 40 degrees C, 180 mil. And this is done naturally with a membrane pump. As a side note, um, applications in pharma, and not only, but specifically in pharma, uh, we do have a oil-free, that's something you would want to keep on your radar screen, an oil-free diaphragma pump. And with that, Frank, it's your turn. Yeah, okay. We are a bit curious to, to know a bit more about your application, what you are using when you're when talking about vacuum drying ovens. So I will start a little survey right now. Please specify the amounts of solvents processed, uh, which you are dealing during a day. It, is that lower than 10 milliliters? Is that between 10 and 100? Or is that above the 100 milliliters? Please vote that we know a bit more in which amounts you're working in. Results coming in. So let's give another couple of seconds. Now a tight run. A tight run, low tar between 10 and 100 and above 100. Oh, okay. Very oh, interesting. Okay. So I, I think I can already share. Most of the participants already voted. So it's 40% above 100, 35% between 10 and 100, and just 25% lower than 10 milliliters a day. Thank you for voting. Right. Yes, thank you also from our side. Really appreciate your information here. So let's continue. Next slide. That basically is just a summary of what we just saw from the curves. Under pressure, temperature relationship, um, that's the water boil thing. That's why water boils at uh, lower temperatures on, the, on Mount Everest, for example. Uh, the vapor boiling pressure, temperature, time relationship, we talked about that, and the vapor boiling pressure, temperature, amount of solvent dry. Once again, thank you for your input. Increasing amounts of solvents lead to increasing drying times. All right then, typical applications. And I think this, uh, this is something very interesting for you. Um, at least that's what we assume from all those questions, the inquiries we have from uh, customers um, and their applications. Uh, but here you have a couple of them, very typical one. 
um, drying and curing temperature and or O2 sensitive specimens. That was the chocolate analogy, a drying of specimens um, susceptible to dust in clean rooms, for example. That is also something very, very important, not only in life science, but naturally also in automotive, electronic, uh, fine mechanical um, areas refining purification of secondary plant products. Um, you can even find vacuum drying chambers, uh, ATEX certified ones um, in, in purification of THC uh, cannabis, for example. That is also used a nice example um, for secondary plant products. Removal of residual moisture, something very, very typical of water, non-flammable acidic acid or um, the, the flammable solvents when cleaning oily, greasy uh, uh, samples, drying of flammable solvents above LEL. Normally, ladies and gentlemen, you have your safety um, data sheet. As I said, we'll be taking a look at Gestis in just a moment. Bubble removal coating. Um, that is another very, very interesting thing where you actually are pulling out um, um, the bubbles out of resins, for example, or even that chocolate covered marshmallow for the sense of sake of discussion. Outgassing of VOCs, uh, volatile organic compounds out of um, um, tubes, for example, used tubing or tubing lines used in, in pharmaceutical industries during manufacturing um, cosmetics or even food and beverage. Uh, delivering fluids like water and whatever to the final product. You don't want them to have those polymerization starters and stoppers um, in that product in the uh, tubes, which eventually find their way and spread to the product. So that's also something the manufacturer actually of these pipes um, has to certify. Aging of metal alloys, aluminum, for example, combination of, of these shown is always very, very common um, and altitude simulation. There are ASTM um, specifications, took a look at that a couple of weeks ago, um, simulating altitudes, planes drying uh, di at, 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 I think it is 500 so-and-so millibars for at least a couple of hours to test the packaging. Something quite unusual, it has nothing to do with drying, something um, out of the um, row application. What I'd like to do right now, since we're talking about vacuum drying ovens, is we're going to focus right now on drying procedures where you have a pretty high um, lower uh, uh, explosion level. And this is Gestis. Mentioned it a couple of times, German Social Accident Insurance. You have the link here, freely accessible without any cost. And if we, and I hope this works right now, usually it does, we can go online to guess this, um, and it's pretty neat. Um, all you have to do, for example, and I'm gonna stick to my um, ethanol example, without any further click um, or entering, you get a list right here of all of those solvents registered at in Gestis, a data bank with the word um, ethanol. And we're gonna stick to ethanol. And you can go over here and now you have your SDS, your safety data sheet. Right, updated, you can even change to English, which we will do. There you go. And you have your CAS number, 64175. We're gonna be needing that later on when we're talking about safety drying chambers. Um, and you can scroll down. Um, let's see, where am I? And you will find, aside from a lot of other information we don't need right now, um, we will find following the flashpoint the explosion data. And this is what I've been talking about, lower explosion data. 3.11 volume percent, respectively 59 grams per cubic meter. And every, every solvent, every um, solvent has that, even water is one of the uh, more fantastic, uh, very, very incredible solvents around here on earth. And you see the temperature class, T2, right? So T2, that would be the information would suit um, a ATEX certified vacuum drying chamber, which can do T1, T2, and T3. All right, so if you have any, any kind of questions on, on your solvent and you don't have the uh, most current SDS, um, then 
um, I recommend visiting, oops, now we skip, sorry for this. How did I get there? There you go. Hang on, don't leave me. All right, now, um, what is T1, T2, and T3? Actually, that's a line of scrimmage after T3. That's between T4, T5, and T6. Um, we find it quite complicated in many cases. Um, and to make it as easy as possible to focus on T1, T2, and T3 temperature classes, just let me remove this. And, and life looks a lot brighter right now. It's not as, as full stuffed as with those other. And then if you go down, you can see each one of those temperature classes has those specific solvents, acetone, acidic acid, formic acid, and so on. Um, and that might be a little bit complicated for you. So left over, and that's very, very important for you after visiting the SDS um, and you wanna choose a APEX certified uh, vacuum pump uh, and chamber there, those are the classes you need. And that depends naturally on the ignition temperature. All right, so that's an easy way, information you can find on Guestis. Another thing you must consider uh, for your application, um, are the explosion zones. Um, I use the typical scenario here on the left-hand side, every one of us encounter daily, um, either while we're filling our tank or uh, driving by a gasoline station, a filling station. Here you have a nice example of those three zones. Um, and I'm not gonna dive further into this. Um, zone zero, that's the most dangerous. And you have that aside from the quantitative, from the quantity described um, exposure times and, and concentrations, an area in which an explosion atmosphere is present continuously for long periods of time um, or will frequently occur. That's the most dangerous part. That's the ugliest part. Then zone one, an area in which an explosion of atmosphere is likely to occur occasionally in normal operation. Um, and it may exist because of repair, maintenance, operation, or leakages. And zone two, from those three explosion zones, that's the, the easiest way, a place in which an explosive atmosphere is not likely to occur in normal operation. So those are the zones you can, you can find next time um, you're at the filling station. Now, why am I showing you this? Well, mandatory considerations in a lab. You must be aware of that. It's, so it's not only the SDS you have to consider, the safety data sheet and the properties for your solvent. You also have to um, take a look at the explosion zones. And what we have on the left-hand side, you see the utilities, um, a water faucet and two electrical plugs, sockets. And on the right-hand side, same thing, both in a non-explosion zone, and that is key, and then you have typically in a laboratory, pharmaceutical industry, for example, zone zero, zone one, zone two, with those given definitions. Now, what does that mean for a vacuum drying oven? Now, this is a vacuum drying oven, ladies and gentlemen, please get this straight, for non-flammables. This is for temperature sensitive, for oxidation sensitive specimens. Think of that little video clip we just visited. And those are the issues, no flammables. Um, and there you have the possibility, and there are many, many um, um, uh, combinations here. Um, Andreas was, um, has encountered many of these questions. So if you do have a question in that area, please ask. Um, air, nitrogen, argon, and xenon. You can flush the interior of a vacuum drying chamber. All right, then you need one socket for the chamber, power supply, the other socket, power supply for the pump. Why do you need water? Water is naturally cooling the condenser in the pump. That's how we have, uh, have one of those typical scenarios for the golden rule that we follow here at Binder. Condensation takes place at the coldest spot always. It's, it's gonna happen to me in a couple of days right now. I come in from the cold into a place where it's warm and my glass is hot. That's condensation at the coldest spot, a dew point temperature issue, right? So that's why we need water to cool the condenser of the pump. For non-flammables, now what does it look like? And oh behold, 
Here we have a APEX certified vacuum chamber, regardless of the size at least. Here you have those combination possibilities, nitrogen frequently used because it is inert. It um, supports any kind of oxidation sensitive specimens to protect them basically. Um, argon and xenon, and you can actually place this in zone two, but not in zone one and zone zero. Um, why not? Well, that's what well, has to do with liability issues from our side. That is, is something that we would like to limit to this to keep those, those risks handling um, 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 in a reasonable um, um, tolerance band. And what you do see now, those two sockets and the water faucet are not in zone two. They are outside in the non-explosive area. Why? Because here you have ignition sources, those sockets. All you need is a spark and you're in trouble. So that's why the sockets, the facilities are outside of that explosion zone two, while the unit itself, we have a dozen that is, as I said, very costly um, in time and, and money and nerves to get a, and develop and design a vacuum chamber which has over a dozen safety features um, to be able to place it in a zone two environment. Frequently asked questions, ladies and gentlemen. There are different solutions for transporting the heat onto the shelves. Don't forget, we don't have a fan, that's physics. By the way, there's no sound and no explosion. Uh, when you take a look at science fiction, films, Star Wars, and if you want to, it'd be pretty boring if we didn't have that Hollywood touch on those things. And no sound, actually. Um, now you see two possibilities. You see on the left-hand side a video. This is something we have especially designed uh, racks. Uh, which you can put in pretty sturdy build, either stainless steel or aluminum. They have a very simple mechanism. And that mechanism, if you uh, take a very close look at it, that presses those lashes against the sidewalls. Why? Because we're heating the sidewalls. And that's where the heat energy goes into those lashes, onto the shelf, and then into the specimens. There are, there are units in there which don't have this mechanical um, issue. Here they have electrical pin situations. Um, each one of those shelves has a socket, um, but that has a couple of downsides you should be aware of. If you're looking for something above lower explosion level, you need an Apex certified chamber, and that is not possible because you're conducting, you have a current flow in the chamber, which is regarded as a ignition source. You have fixed positions because you're depending on those sockets, and you have a risk of corrosion due to condensation in those sockets, and even those pins may break. So that then is a maintenance issue. We um, divided with the Binder solution right here, um, the more sturdy, long-lasting, robust solution. All right, choosing the right pump. As I already mentioned, oil-free diaphragma pump or membrane pump, if you want. We're using right here uh, different pumps, and this is to, has to, to increase your awareness. A pump is not a pump. There are different final pressures. What a final pressure is, I'll be showing you in just a minute, so hang on in there. Right here, we have seven millibars on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, 1.8 millibars. Um, the two basically means twice as strong. I think that's pretty easy to remember. And what does that actually mean? And you see on the right-hand side that geometry. Now, let me solve that issue with the geometry. We have the block laying flat on the surface, and we have the star with uh, two points on the shelf surface. And that has um, an influence on the choice of pumps. You always go for a stronger pump with the lower final pressure, if you have higher throughput per day, because it goes quicker. You achieve that under pressure you're looking at quicker. So if you do that once a day, hey, VAP1 would be okay. 
if you do that multiple times a day, you would want to go to a stronger pump to enable more runs per day. Um, samples with a poor thermal conductivity, for example, plastic. Um, plastics do not conduct thermal energy that good in comparison to metal. So if you have something of that type, go for the stronger pump. The smaller contact surface, think of those star and those two points um, in contact with the shelf, that would be something. If it's not lying flat as a piece of paper on your shelf, you wanna make uh, sure that you have a stronger pump to get it through that very pointy, let me say, geometry. And that goes back to one of our questions. So the first question we said, any amount of solvent greater 100 milliliters, we highly recommend the stronger pump, regardless if from Binder or your own pump or from another company. That is sort of, of four points to consider when choosing um, the right pump for your application. And it's very, very frequent, this question. That's why we're sharing that. Um, if you're asking yourself a final pressure, what does that mean? Um, here you have those three terms used when it comes around to vacuum pumps. Nominal speed, actual speed, final speed. The final speed, ladies and gentlemen, that, well, actually everything is quite easy. The uh, nominal speed, that is when the pump is running dry. It's just sucking in air. That's the maximum uh, uh, suction they develop. And the final speed, that is the lowest available pressure, the seven millibars, the 1.8 millibars. And the actual speed, as you might have guessed, that is what you have programmed. That's your setting. And you can see that those curves differentiate. And that it is absolutely true that VAP2, that was the thing to remember, is about twice as strong as one for those specific applicational um, requirements. Another very frequently asked question, what's the difference between a speed controlled vacuum pump and a fixed speed vacuum pump? Um, basically, um, um, Andreas told me, hey, very, very um, comparable in the parameter accuracies. Uh, with the speed control, you have a separate programming of pump and chamber is necessary. Not so with a fixed speed vacuum pump. You can do the programming over the chamber. If you forget get bending down and crawling into or crawling to the pump, and programming it separately. You can do that very nicely with a fixed speed one. More expensive is the speed controlled one and lower noise level. That uh, might be an advantage for the speed control vacuum pumps. Fixed speed is always a little bit noisier, but still within a reasonable range. This is um, just to visualize why you need a ATEX pump for an ATEX chamber. If you take a look at the, at the left stack, the blue window indicates that is your flammable solvent inside. It's flooded everywhere. The, air, the, the, the vacuum is full of that solvent. And down below, you see the a pump with the catches, the cold spot, and the tubing. They're also blue, and they contain that flammable solvent. And that's why you need a ATEX certified, because they're in direct contact, even the condenser where the solvent runs through, has contact with that flammable solvent. So that has to be ATEX certified. And the tubes, the lining on the right-hand side, that stack, um, where you lead the uh, uh, solvent gas through uh, from the chamber to the pump, is also filled with flammable. So all the entire system, not only the chamber, has to be ATEX certified. Just to put that very clear. Five typical applications. Um, and this right now, Frank, it's your turn again. Yeah. So the same procedure, Nota, I, I would guess. Please vote yep. and specify your process and or your application there. Uh, please choose what you currently use in your daily work uh, to give us some insights what applications you are driving day by day.
Okay, <clears throat> results coming in. So I, I think that is a more or less clear picture, Lota. Um, seven, roughly 70% uh, are drying flammable and 70% are drying non-flammable solvents while the rest is tempering and outgassing solvents just. So ah, thanks again very... for voting. Interesting. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Now let's proceed to those typical applications. Um, eager to show you that. And we build it up a little bit, the structure of these, these slides, a little bit as a protocol. Pharma drying of silicon and stainless steel valves. You see that um, product, the sample, if you want, on the right-hand side. Um, and we have deionized water. And the cast number, you can find that on Gestis and the safety data sheet, for example, for water. LEL water does not have a lower explosion level. The amount, and that's why we ask that question, is below 100 millimeter per run. Temperature 50 degrees C. Um, pressure level set at zero millibars for three hours approximately, whereas, please beware, the final pressure, and we talked about that a couple of minutes ago, um, is less than five millibars. The type of gas used, not uh, uh, um, nitrogen, but ambient air. And this is used in general, not only with the application shown on the right-hand side for complex geometries with cavities and blind holes with a bad thermal conductivity. Um, and the objective to achieve particle-free complete dryness following a rinsing process with deionized uh, de water. Another one, from the jewelry area, from the metal, metal alloy area, once again using uh, water um, for a rinsing process, the amount around about 10 times more than just same 100 milliliters, um, 50 degrees C over five hours. So we have an extended time with ambient air once again. Um, and it can be, and that is the sample, the, this DNI, deionized water can be very uh, uh, corrosive at higher temperatures. So that's where we're drying at lower temperatures, at 50 degrees C. Um, then you can go into air bubbles, removing air bubbles from a polymeric resin chemical industry, for example, not only, but we're talking about resins. Um, these bubbles um, and the specimen themselves, um, they are without any further specification, 40 degrees C uh, with a final pressure below five millibars for one hour to draw those bubbles out of the resins um, from honey-like chemical substances. Um, drying ovens are therefore no options because higher temperature and the water used right here um, um, would cause corrosion. Electronic industry, microchips, once again, ambient temperature with a slow ramp. You can actually, ladies and gentlemen, program ramps. It's not only just one value, one temperature value, you can also pr program different ones, slowly returning back to ambient temperature when you break it, not suddenly, but controlled, less than one hour. Once again, ambient air, the microchip glues to uh, carrier plates with a double-sided tape. That is the application. Um, and any kind of air bubble in that double-sided tape disturbs that carrying property and the functioning property. And that's why you want to remove that out of these adhesive surfaces. So that's an electronic industry and electric components right here. We have an acetone. We have an LEL of 60 grams per um, cubic meter. Um, so there, that's the line of scrimmage. Do you go for a safety drying chamber or do you go for a APEX certified vacuum drying chamber? You have four kilograms per run, right? And 120 milliliters of acetone. Temperature 80 degrees C, as you can read, four to 16 hours, depending upon the amount. And naturally you have, I cannot emphasize that um, um, often, uh, often enough, Atex pump. Um, it's a mixture of powders um, used for safety feet, uh, safety switches, for example, and it quickly achieves complete dryness at low cost with a vacuum drying chamber. Frank, it's your turn again. Yeah, perfect. Bridge loader to our next poll. So 
last but not least, please specify your maximum temperature you are working with in your daily work. You should know already why this is important. So let's wait a couple of seconds. Okay, no, that seems that a third is uh, up to 60 uh, degrees and followed by, yeah, equally 110 and 150. Um, mm -hmm. and last but not least, 20% um, are up to 90 degrees working. Uh, and 5%, yeah, sorry for that, 5% are up to 150 degrees. Oh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for again that for what? All right, now let's continue. Cleaning a vacuum pump and an oven. How do you do that properly? One very, very strong recommendation, ladies and gentlemen, please read the operation manual. There you have specifically a described step-by-step um, -step what to do, which components uh, need which agents. And I'd like to share this slide with you right here, the controller housing. Um, here you need commercial cleaning detergents, soap suds, free of acids and halides, because these are usually made of plastic. And observe the recommendations of the manufacturers. The exterior surfaces, all of them, the door, the housing, for example. Once again, cleaning detergents, soap suds, free of acids. I think that's the key point. And halides, alcohol-based solutions are possible. Once again, following the um, operation manual. The handle, um, once again, detergent, soap, sud, uh, soap suds free. Um, and then you can continue the glassware, no acetone, please. And there are some uh, combinations with the window where you have glass in combination with polymeric material. Uh, we did have um, one customer doing cleaning the uh, polymeric uh, window with acetone and he needed a replacement, all right? So that's something to be aware of because you do, do wanna view what's taking place inside, all right? So that's a um, side note right here. Zinc coated hinge parts, right? Please never use neutral cleaning agents or zinc uh, on zinc covered uh, surfaces. That leads to um, corrosion we don't want. Racks and rack holders. Um, no salt solutions or chlorinated solvents um, depends upon if you have stainless steel racks or aluminum racks. Aluminum racks, um, they, they conduct thermal energy a lot more better, a lot better than uh, stainless steel, whereas stainless steel is more, as you might know, more chemical resistant than aluminum ones. Your choice when it comes around to um, configurating your vacuum drying chamber. Inner chamber here, stainless steel. Um, free of acid uh, or halides, alcohol-based solutions. If we're talking about biological contamination, which comes up once in a while, um, that is a possibility. Uh, using alcoholic-based solutions, the door gasket, uh, silicon or um, FKM, once again, depends upon the application. The one more chemical resistant, the other more temperature resistant, can also be removed and cleaned. ATEX certified ovens and pumps in red. Please, ladies and gentlemen, regardless of what it is, before cleaning, make sure you have no explosive atmosphere in the insulation area. Um, make sure that you unplug it. Clean the unit, um, never clean it in a potentially explosive area. Um, using a dry cloth is a no-go because we don't want any electrostatic charges one of those safety issues. All of our units and the pumps are grounded to get around of this hazard, to eliminate this. Um, so that is something, and please obey what you find in the operation manual. The pump itself, um, acetone with a soft cleaning aid, um, service manual required, that's something that you would uh, want to um, have done by a technical um, engineer, by a professional. The exterior housing, the same thing, 
um, um, goes as for the housing of the chamber, the hoses themselves free of acid or halides. Rinsing is something here very, very important or else you'll have contamination in your final catch during the next run. The separator themselves, glassware, you can put them also in a labware washer. If there are no residuals left over, the catch itself. Um, and those are the things that you can observe when it comes around to cleaning a pump. Um, vacuum drying ovens, getting rid of biological uh, contamination as addressed. Um, you do have the possibility, um, at least with the uh, one for non-flammables, to heat it up to 190 degrees C. That is a sterilization. That is not disinfection anymore. And it does depend upon the exposure time, roughly about two hours or so. You can spray the inner one with appropriate agents. Um, and the racks themselves can be autoclave, for example. Uh, flammable solvents, beware um, to conduct that according to what we just heard. Uh, for biological uh, um, contaminants or decontamination, the agents and having that autoclave at 121 degrees C at pressured air. Mandatory procedure, and that goes for all of them. And this is something. Um, make sure that you don't have any infectious, non-toxic uh, material inside, radioactive substances. I think that's common sense. Uh, be sure to switch it off. Don't forget, uh, disconnect the power supply to really make sure the plug themselves, um, let it cool down to ambient temperature. Um, so we're really working here on the safe side. Uh, the chamber will not get wet using damp cleaning aids. Um, never spill water inside, uh, difficult to clean, um, might uh, form corrosion, wipe it down with a damp cleaning aid um, and wait until they are completely dry. Reassure yourself that there are no residuals inside or you're gonna have to have a prior run uh, uh, um, uh, process to really make sure you're getting all of those uh, residuals out there. The same goes for the pumps naturally. The right choice to finalize and wrap up the session. I'd like to spend a couple of slides right here. We're almost done. Two more minutes on safety drying ovens. And the big thing right here to distinguish it is the LEL. Where do you find it? Guess this or your safety data sheet. And using um, ethanol right here, anything that is in the blue area of temperature and concentration, that is something you can use for the safety drying oven. If it is above that uh, dotted red line in the yellow, then you need an Atex uh, vacuum drying oven. That's the point of differentiation right here between safety drying oven. If it's below LEL, go for the safety drying oven. It usually is more price attractive. If it is above, no chance, ladies and gentlemen, Atex certified. And that naturally always depends as we learn from, um, on, on the temperature. That's the guestus. We took a look at that. You will find here on our homepage a solvent curve. You can find that out. You will recognize that curve um, at a specific temperature. You will get a specific amount of your solvent in our safety drying chamber, not in cubic meter, but in our chamber with um, 156 liters. And that's the point of differentiation. That's a little helper we can provide. And as Frank said, you will receive the slide deck. Differentiation between the two, um, there is no restriction to the explosion zone and no limitation to the temperature class for a safety drying oven. Um, that is the big, big uh, difference to a ATEX drying oven, vacuum drying oven, and the LEL naturally. And this is our little helper we'd like to provide you. Um, a, 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 the US Americans call this a cheat sheet. Uh, pre-qualifying leads cheat, that's what the sales call it. For our customers, this is just giving you a couple of questions in your hand to help you differentiate, to find your way through the jungle of, of different specs and parameters and what you need. And on the left-hand side, you see a very, very clear path with a few questions leading you to the right product, uh, regardless of binder or not. And on the right-hand side, if it's more oxygen temperature sensitive, then you have right here the possibility to choose 
the pumps once again, very easily, more than 100 milliliters, less than 100 milliliters. And I think this is a little helper um, using even your finger if it's on your screen. We got an insulation guide, pre insulation What do you have to consider before delivery? For example, Apex, there has to be an Apex certified signature person on site to deal with the situation of insulation. And that was it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us. I think right on time right here. Have a great day. Um, if you have any questions, uh, time is out. Please want to uh, forward them to Frank. Um, and I suppose our chat master, Dr. Andreas Richter, did his job very well and answered the questions you had. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Lothar. Uh, and as Lothar correctly said, uh, you will receive all the slides and recordings right after the webinar. If any questions are left after the webinar, and that is what is usually going on in your day-to-day -day work, the most questions will appear. Don't hesitate to to contact your Avanto or Binda sales representative or ask your question even to the webinar at avantosciences.com email address you will get right after that webinar. Thanks again for joining us today. Thanks, Dota, for giving us all that valuable insights. And I wish you all a great rest of the day. Thank you and goodbye. Bye-bye, everybody. Take care.